I'm John Glecklin. I have the uh, honor and privilege of serving as the chair of the ABA Antitrust Law Section this year. Welcome, everybody, to the Enforcers Roundtable. The the, this is the last program of our first in-person meeting in, in three years. And I want to thank everybody here for coming, our amazing section staff, and the leaders of the spring meeting program for all of the work they've done to put the program for the last three days together. This is the greatest show on earth, at least for those of us in the antitrust competition and uh, consumer protection and data privacy bars. Um, I want to thank our friends at the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice and their public affairs team for live streaming this to an audience around the world. This Enforcers Roundtable is always a highlight of the spring meeting, and this year is no exception. Today, we are joined by leaders of the world's most important competition authorities who have agreed to share with us their enforcement priorities, their achievements, and the setbacks from the past year, and perhaps most importantly, where they see things going. With me today to ask questions is Melanie Aitken of Bennett Jones, our section secretary and, and membership officer, and perhaps more importantly, Canada's former top antitrust enforcer at the Canadian Competition Bureau. It's my pleasure now to introduce the enforcers who are with us today to answer questions in alphabetical order. They are Gwendolyn J. Cooley, who is the NAG Antitrust Task Force Chair and with the Office of the Wisconsin Attorney General. Alexander Cordero Macedo, who is the President of the Administrative Council for Economic Defense, or CADE, of Brazil. Jonathan Cantor, the Assistant Attorney General at the United States Department of Justice. Lena M. Kahn, the Chair of the Federal Trade Commission. And to my left, Margreta Vestager, the Vice President, excuse me, Executive Vice President and Commissioner at the European Commission. Let's get started, everyone. So let me just start out by giving everybody on the panel a chance to provide any updates that they have on significant developments at your agencies, whether on matters or personnel or policy initiatives. Jonathan, why don't we start with you? Sure, thank you so much, um, Jonathan, and, um, and I'm disappointed that I can't be with you, all of you there in person today, but uh, I'm delighted that I have the opportunity to join you and my fellow enforcers um, uh, by video. And so um, I, I look forward to hopefully uh, being out of quarantine and, and, um, and an opportunity to, to see many of my friends and colleagues in person very soon. Um, let me start by, um, by saying that um, we are um, firing on all cylinders at the Department of Justice right now, uh, Antitrust Division. Um, if there are um, a number of uh, takeaways that I want to, or if there are some key takeaways that I think I want you to leave with. First is, we're not afraid to take on the big cases, and we're not afraid to take on big companies, period, full stop. Um, second is we're not afraid to litigate. We have more cases in litigation than in recent memory at the Department of Justice. On the civil side, we have six ongoing civil litigations against Google, American Airlines, Penguin Random House, U.S. Sugar, United, he United Health, uh, and Versatech. Uh, that's just on the civil side. Um, we are, have over 20 cases in active litigation on the criminal side. And let me just say on all fronts, we are just getting started. Second, we are expanding um, our reach beyond the Washington DC beltway. Uh, it is extremely important for us that we provide greater access to justice and greater access to the Justice Department. Antitrust affects citizens. It affects consumers, it affects workers, it affects small businesses, it affects our democracy. Uh, we are not being faithful to the goals of the antitrust laws, the plain text of the statute, unless we are reaching out and seeking input from uh, a broader range of stakeholders. And so what does that mean? That means we are using plain language, we are changing the language of antitrust to make it more accessible uh, to more people so that it can be more participatory. Uh, we are going out, we are conducting as part of our work with the FTC, listening sessions to hear from affected stakeholders, to open it up to the public. Um, this is extremely important for us uh, and something we are um, uh, very excited to build on in the coming months. Um, finally, uh, we are not going to let up on our criminal enforcement program. We are going to hold 
individuals and companies accountable for violations of the law. Antitrust is a crime. Uh, and we are, we'll talk a little bit, I'm sure, later about some changes to our leniency policy and some other initiatives. Uh, but we intend to vigorously enforce the antitrust laws. And when criminal penalties are consistent with the facts of the law and the, rule, and the principles of uh, uh, criminal prosecution at the federal level, we will not uh, hesitate one bit uh, to seek uh, the full slate of remedies under the law. Thanks, Jonathan. Lena? Hey everyone, um, nice to be with you all, uh, albeit virtually. I'm um, also, before diving in, just want to give a big thanks to the DOJ team for live streaming and to the ABA team for making this virtual format uh, available given the uh, spike in, in cases that we're seeing. So it's an incredibly busy and exciting time at the Commission. Uh, we have a historically high caseload um, on, on the antitrust side, and enforcing the law is our top priority. Uh, we have a full docket, and we are going to continue to prioritize litigation. And we've recently seen a great set of successes on both the merger and the conduct size sides. Um, so on mergers, we're coming off a string of strong victories. Uh, we saw three back-to-back -back merger abandonments uh, in response to FTC challenges, uh, as well as an extremely favorable ruling from the Third Circuit um, in one of our hospital merger cases. And I think it's, it's worth noting that, you know, two of those abandonments were in the context of vertical challenges. So to have parties abandon um, in the context of, of vertical challenges, I think, really speaks to the incredible talent at the agency, as well as the real skill and muscle that the teams have built, uh, assessing vertical harms and bringing vertical challenges, and that will continue to be a priority. Um, on conduct, uh, we had a couple of important developments um, in the last few months. Uh, in the Viera litigation, we got a across-the-board win in our case against Martin Shkreli. Uh, the judge found him individually liable for an unreasonable restraint of trade and monopolization. And notably, the judge also banned him from the industry. Uh, the industry ban being precedent-setting relief in the antitrust context. And we're going to be continuing to push both for individual liability and industry bans where we think they're appropriate. Um, and then in our major Facebook litigation, we of course defied the motion to dismiss um, after we filed a revised complaint in August. And I think, you know, in Judge Boesberg's opinion, we see some important developments, including the recognition that privacy degradation and decline of data protection can constitute harms to the competitive process. And I think this effort overall really marks our, is, is part of our broader effort to really push the law and make sure that it's advancing to keep pace with some of these new market realities, especially in the, con especially in the context of digital market markets. Um, and I would say, separate from some of our ongoing matters, we are currently taking a very close look at the entire merger investigation process. So I joined the commission during a historic surge in merger filings with deal volume off the charts. And I think that experience in particular surfaced some of the particular strains that we face that make it challenging for us to fully investigate potentially unlawful deals and bring lawsuits um, within the HSR timelines. So some of those strains are a feature of the current legal regime. Uh, other strains are a feature of processes and decisions that are within the discretion of the antitrust agencies. And so in, in uh, lockstep with the DOJ, we are taking a close look and making sure we're making amendments where needed so that we can fully discharge our duty to investigate and enforce the law uh, when we encounter unlawful deals. Um, we, of course, as part of that overall process, are also currently reviewing the merger guidelines. Um, we launched that revision process in tandem with DOJ in January. And the goal there is really twofold. Um, so first is to ensure that the guidelines are accurately reflecting the current market realities, uh, the realities of how firms are acquiring and exercising market power through acquisitions in the modern economy. Um, and second is, is really ensuring that the guidelines are accurately reflecting the state of law. So that's uh, one, one additional project. And then the second is we're taking a close look at the HSR form and assessing whether there are ways to collect on the front end information that is more probative of whether the parties are proposing an unlawful deal. Um, the idea being that having a form that's more probative in this way can make our investigation far more timely and efficient. Um, and I'd say across the board, we're really looking to ensure that our enforcement work is seeking to promote deterrence. Um, I see our goal is cracking down on illegal activity in the marketplace, uh, including illegal deals. I think the degree to which proposing facially unlawful deals um, has become normalized is a serious problem for enforcers, and so addressing that is a top priority for us. 
Um, one step that we took last year was to reverse course um, and, and return the agency to its practice of uh, using prior approvals in merger settlements, and we're continuing to consider additional ways to, uh, to promote deterrence. Um, and then I would just echo um, the AAG in you know, really trying to ensure that the commission is engaging deeply with the public, um, and cre creating opportunities for greater public participation. Um, to make sure that our work is really reflecting the actual challenges that the people are facing in markets due to unlawful monopolization or mergers. Thank you. Gwendolyn? So with AAGs from across the country on, by my count, 14 panels at the spring meeting this year, you've spent much of the last three days hearing about all of our good work. And as you've heard, we are cooperating very well with our federal counterparts. Like on the Google case, where some of us joined with the U.S. Department of Justice, and others joined the Colorado-Nebraska Google case, all of which are joined in the same court with a hearing this afternoon. States have been working well together, or had been working well together with the FTC on the Facebook case, and as you all now know, the states are pursuing an appeal. But there are other tech cases that the states are pursuing on their own. The Google in-app payments case that Utah and North Carolina are leading alleges that Google engaged in anti-competitive conduct related to the Google Play Store. The states recently amended their complaint in part as a response to last September's Epic v. Apple decision. Also last fall, the judicial panel on multi-district litigation moved the Texas ad tech case against Google to the Southern District of New York over the attorneys general's protests. Although this case is moving swiftly, which is a good thing, uh, whether joined to that case or not, the state AGs nearly unanimously, 52 attorneys general, sent a letter to Congress discussing their support for the State Antitrust en Enforcement Venue Act of 2021, which would allow the attorneys general to choose our own venue when we file antitrust cases. Choosing our own venue puts us on a more equal footing with our federal, federal counterparts and would potentially prevent the incredible delays inherent in being joined in, with class litigation and helps reduce the costs associated with antitrust litigation for state taxpayers. Thank you, Chair Khan, for your kind letter endorsing this legislation. There are also consumer tech cases, like the New Mexico settlement with Google over Children's Online Privacy Act, Privacy Protection Act violations, and attorneys general from DC, Indiana, Texas, and Washington also have another litigation against Google for its location tracking practices and my favorite phrase, dark patterns. Many of you know the pharmaceutical industry is a longtime target of state antitrust enforcement. Obviously, I would be remiss if I did not mention the $26 billion opioid settlement signed by 52 states and territories with the nation's three largest pharmaceutical distributors, Cardinal, McKesson, and Amerisource Bergen. The agreement marks the culmination of three years of negotiations to resolve more than 4,000 claims of state and local governments across the country and is the second largest settlement in the U.S. history. As we just heard from Chair Khan, the states really played an important role in the case against Viera and Martin Screeley. State law was very important with the precedent-setting rulings on disgorgement, joint and several liability, and injunctions, particularly that lifetime industry ban. Um, the judge also, as you heard, banned him for life from participating in the pharmaceutical industry in any capacity as a result of his flagrant and reckless conduct. The states are all still, also still working on a number of other pharmaceutical cases. The state's Suboxone product hopping case that I lead. The price fixing cases against the generic drugs industry led by a team from Connecticut, New York, and Florida, amongst others and we continue to try to hold that industry accountable. Also, as many of you know, the states review a lot of healthcare transactions. As you've also just heard, Rhode Island recently blocked a proposed merger between Lifespan and Care New England under its state hospital conversion statute, which ultimately joined, Rhode Island did, ultimately joined with the FTC um, to sue to block that transaction. Out in California, the AG re con recently conditionally approved a hospital merger case where Kaiser took a 30% stake in St. Mary's Medical Center, ordering price caps and other interesting behavioral remedies. Whereas on the structural side, Utah recently settled with DeVita Total Renal Care, 
ordering a fourth clinic divested beyond that required by the FTC. But the states review everything that affects us, from broiler chicken cases in Washington state to airlines with the Northeast Alliance case. So we have a lot going on, and if you're looking for a new job, we're hiring. Thank you very much, um, Margareta. Well, if, if you knew how I've been looking forward to be in a room with no window and hundreds of lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, being back in person, it's, this is where we want to go. Uh, and even I think if this turns out to be a super spreader event, uh, <laughs> I think we should make sure that, that it's worth it. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so just some, uh, some food for thought. Uh, we hope to keep you busy because we just uh, started the evaluation of Regulation 1 uh, in order to, to know if our enforcement tools, if they are effective, uh, if our processes uh, are effective. And we will do quite a number of, uh, of stakeholder reach outs uh, in order to learn uh, how you see this. Of course, this is a long process, but first things first, we need to know how this has worked for you. Uh, we keep ourselves quite busy on the, on the caseload. Uh, we have two Amazon cases right now, one on third-party data uh, collected via the Amazon marketplace from sort of the third-party uh, retailers for the benefit of, uh, of Amazon retail as we see it and as we stated it in, in the statement of objection, enabling Amazon retail uh, to have you know, much fewer products but to take the lion's share of, uh, of the turnover of the marketplace. Uh, second Amazon case is about the buy box, uh, how to get in there because people using Amazon will know that very often what is in the buy box is what you buy. So we're figuring out how to get in there. Is that related uh, to whether or not you also subscribe to Amazon Fulfillment? Or is it actually sort of a fair representation of what may be interesting for the customer? We have um, a couple of Apple cases. Uh, we have the music streaming case. Uh, the SO was, uh, was sent last year uh, almost uh, to the day. Um, on the mandatory use of uh, in-app payment system with a 30% fee in combination with the anti-steering provisions. Uh, and of course, in particular, where there is a competition between uh, Apple services and uh, the apps that are forced to use this mechanism, of course, really interesting. Uh, second, uh, we also have a more general uh, Apple case on, on the App Store. Uh, but the third Apple case concerns the near field communication, so the NFC uh, technology. Seems as if access is restricted, which means that others who want to uh, enable payments uh, uh, have huge difficulties uh, if it's not impossible for them uh, to do that. So little competition when it comes to what kind of payment would you want to, to use uh, your phone to do. Uh, we have a Facebook or Meta case. Uh, based on dominance in, uh, in social networks, uh, favoring their own uh, classified uh, app business, uh, using data from other classified app services, uh, we're pushing uh, forward to that as well. Uh, second uh, advertising related case is uh, looking into the Google uh, ad tech stack, uh, seeing if, if that full uh, vertical uh, integration uh, is actually uh, beneficial, and here we combine also with a look into the privacy sandbox. Uh, and latest, uh, we have opened uh, a case where we have the concern that it might be uh, that Google and Meta has, uh, has agreed to push out a competitor in header bidding. Uh, the code name for the agreement was Jedi Blue, and here we took the lead from the AG of, uh, of Texas uh, really appreciate uh, that one can have that kind of, of cooperation. I think it shows the benefit of enforcers uh, coming together that we can, can do this as well. And, uh, and last but not least, we're also uh, busy in court. Uh, the the um, Google uh, shopping case has been appealed to the ECJ. So 
will of course uh, go there. Um, not the only litigation we have. And uh, I think that is one of the things that will keep us busy. We have different ways of, uh, of doing things. We take a decision first and eventually we go to court. Colleagues here, they, they go to court uh, first. But the litigation uh, part of our work, I, I tell you, keeps us busy uh, as well and it will continue to do that since we will continue to push on with our decisions uh, in the coming months uh, and years. Thank you. Thank you. Alex? So good morning. Good morning, everyone. First of all, before I start my speech, I have to invite everybody. If I don't do this, Margaret will kill me. So uh, I, I want to invite everybody to International Cartel Workshop that's going to happen in June, from June 27 to 29th, and in Lisbon. So great city and great uh, opportunity to see you all again. Done, Margaret. <laughs> 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 so, Kaji has conducted an important antitrust investigation on um, competitive conduct practice by big, big techs. And in 2011, Kaji has conducted an investigation of Google um, Shopping. It's the Google Shopping case. So, in Google, um, it was like uh, being accused to uh, self preferencing, and it was the same case on Europe and also here uh, in the United States. But Google, on the other hand, defended itself by claiming that uh, the exhibition of Google Shopping was beneficial to the consumers and that it did not violate antitrust law in Brazil. So Cadiz Tribunal dismissed the case based on the, on the lack of evidence of uncompetitive behavior um, on the alleged efficiencies which were verified by uh, authority during the investigation. So Kaj investigated this case for seven years, and during those seven years, uh, under the rule of reason, we couldn't find any harm for the consumers. Um, so we, we don't, we're, we're not defending uh, companies that complain were uh, the comparison uh, website of, for comparison prices, and that market was also changing in Brazil. They became in marketplaces. So in that discussion, it was all about the efficiency for consumers at the end of the day. So we didn't see raising prices, we didn't see uh, no uh, uh, bad quality of the product, so we didn't find the harm. Even we were investigating the case for seven years. So, but we have another other investigations against Google. Um, for example, uh, the scrapping case. One of uh, the first investigation, we dismissed the case as well because we didn't have evidence enough. But later in 2019, we opened again the case, the scrapping case, and now it's still under investigation. We're collecting more evidences. We have also investigation uh, uh, against the Android case. That's the Android case. It's also under investigation. We have investigation um, with um, the food market, the delivery food market. That is an important investigation in Brazil. It's, it's going on. Um, a competitor calls Rappi against iFood. It was a claim uh, because iFood was doing a lot of exclusive contracts with the restaurants um, and, and, and we have like more than a, a big share and also uh, a lot of exclusive contracts. And we did uh, interim measures to stop the exclusivity at that time. It not, could not sign another exclu exclusivity contract contract or even uh, renew the contract it was like finishing and this was um, uh, interesting because they didn't appeal and and the case is still in investigation right now let's see what will happen uh, the case in the tribunal is still with the general superintendents as well and we had another case uh, it's a Brazilian platform that uh, get together the consumers the um, the gyms and also the big companies in Brazil. So it's the platform. If you want to go to a gym, you don't have to pay just a gym. You pay the platform and you, you get access to all the platforms in Brazil. They also do an exclusive contract uh, with all gyms in Brazil. And, and also Kaji had uh, uh, granted them by entering measures to, to stop the exclusive contracts. We had also a Uber case. Uh, and the Uber case was uh, a while ago, so we also dismissed the case because you didn't saw any harm, and they, 
that, that time the, 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 the argument was that could be a kind of a, a cartel or something like that, um, then, and we dismissed the case. We didn't find any, any kind of evidence as well under the rule of reason that could cause harm for the, com for the consumers. Thank you uh, for allowing me to be part of this panel. It's a different role, um, maybe a little less stressful um, than in one of your seats, but it's just a delight to be here. Um, for many years now, cooperation and collaboration um, have become routine among the agencies represented up here uh, and elsewhere, of course. Um, it's been a remarkable increase in trust and communication over the years, led um, as a reflection of the hard work of agencies around the world uh, to try to build that trust. It is, of course, in the execution in the particular cases uh, that the opportunities, if you will, uh, for convergence or divergence uh, really do materialize. A case in point, of course, last week, there was the abandonment of the deal by the two shipping equipment manufacturers, uh, Cargo Tech and Cone Cranes, in the face of opposition from the DOJ and the UK CMA, notwithstanding they had secured the approval of the EU uh, by offering certain conditions. And notably, in the announcement of the result, the DOJ uh, thanked uh, its enforcement partners, including those at the ACCC, the EC, and the CMA, for their close and constructive collaboration on the matter. So close collaboration, uh, but different outcomes. I think as a former agency head and all of you who've worked um, in the agencies over the years would appreciate how those two dynamics can coexist. But I think it's interesting, we'd love to hear uh, from all of you about you know, what impact does that have going forward? You work closely together, you build the trust, and then you end up going in different directions. Does it matter what kind of a case uh, it was on? And does it impair in any way your ability to work together uh, going forward? So, uh, Margareta, if we could start with you, that would be great. Well, this is a good place to start because as you said, we just had a re very recent example of very good cooperation and, and diverse uh, outcomes. Uh, we also have a quite recent example of, uh, of, of the same outcome in, in the Standard and, and Poor's uh, H -I, uh, IHS case. Uh, the Commission, the DMA, the DOJ had a similar view uh, and we solved it in, in a similar way. So I think it's a really important discussion because it, it also enables, uh, I think, everyone to see where do we have similarities and where do we have differences, uh, primarily in, in the legal framework, uh, in our obligations. And uh, the Cargotech uh, cone crane merger, uh, we had quite a number of, of serious concerns. So horizontal overlaps in equipment that is really essential for ports to work uh, effectively. And um, the parties, they said, well, we, we work on you to, to try to solve this. Uh, and, and when we have something that serious to deal with, uh, of course, I think we have the same reaction as everyone else. We really would not like to have a mix and match remedy uh, because that may make the remedy difficult uh, viability-wise. Uh, it may be difficult to find a suitable buyer. Uh, so it took some time for, for the parties to find re relevant packages uh, for, uh, for the concerns that we had. At that time, we actually found that the remedy packages, uh, they were good. A uh, strong business proposition, there was a reverse uh, carve out, uh, but otherwise two separate, um, separate packages. And we don't do our work in, in splendid isolation. Not only do we work very closely with colleagues here at the DOJ, the CMA, we also work very closely with the marketplace. So uh, in the process we had not one, but two market tests. Uh, I think give or take 60 participants in each market test, so a really strong uh, feedback uh, from the market. Overall, positive. S still, sometimes one has to guard oneself uh, in order to make sure that the remedy is taken by someone who can actually run with it and make sure that it is competition in the markets to you know, match for the competition lost. 
Uh, so we had uh, even an upfront uh, buyer uh, approval uh, as part of the commitment. And uh, when we have, uh, we ourselves think that the commitments will actually work to remedy the competition concerns, we make sure that risks are being mitigated uh, so that it will be a viable, strong competitor to make up for competition lost. We have a market test that is positive with lots of participants, and in this case, also two market tests. Well, then when we have to reason a, a, a decision, you know, the scope of discretion on our side becomes more and more and more limited because problems seem to be solved. And, uh, and this was why we ended up in a, in a situation where we uh, approved this merger with these uh, important remedy packages. Uh, I think if you look at, at the DOJ, there were differences in, uh, in the market situation. Uh, they had some concerns that, that we didn't have, uh, and I think that to some degree uh, could explain the, the divergence. Uh, with the CMA, it's a bit uh, diff different, uh, because here the market assessment was the same, but they have a, a more fierce stance when it comes to, to remedy packages that consists of of what they saw as, as mix, mix and match, where we think we could actually uh, accept this. Uh, also, the market accepted it because we had quite a lot of buyer interest from the different packages. Long story short, close cooperation, diverse uh, outcomes. What I think is important here is that it should not let anything, anyone believe that that has been deteriorating the trust between us. Uh, because I completely agree with you uh, in your introduction uh, to this part of our discussion that the trust between enforcers have been steadily increasing uh, over the years. And, uh, and I think that is good because we are faced with uh, global uh, competition and here I think we can only match that by working very closely together in respect of the differences that we have in our legal context. Thank you. Um, and Jonathan, you're standing on my shoulder here. You don't realize that, but <laughs> um, if we could, we'd welcome your thoughts on it as well, please. Well, good. Yes, I feel like I should be a robot in the room, but maybe we're a few years off from that. Um, in any event, uh, I want to echo uh, the comments of Madam Executive Vice President, um, which is that um, cooperation and trust is extraordinarily high. We are, um, I've been at the Department of Justice now just over four months, and I'm blown away by the level of cooperation, by the level of graciousness, by the level of substantive input that we provide to one another. Uh, and so um, what I see is a global competition enforcement community that is working extraordinarily well together, uh, that is cooperating with one another uh, for the benefit of the global economy, uh, and where differences, if any, are quite few. Um, and um, the, the merger that was mentioned, I, we did, you know, made sure not just to thank um, uh, uh, the, the CMA, the Australians who reached a similar outcome, but also to thank the European Commission. Why? Because we were standing on their shoulders. We reached the same substantive conclusion regarding the problems with the merger. We have different systems. We have different effects on consumers. Obviously, supply chain issues in the United States are of acute importance. Uh, we have a different legal process. Um, we have a different, um, uh, and I've been quite clear um, that since taking uh, office that remedies are highly disfavored, even in mergers, and that uh, divestiture remedies will be the rare exception rather than the norm. Um, but all of that being said, um, we are, we are better together, and I think the cargo tech home cranes merger is a, is a reflection of that because we reach similar sub sub substantive outcomes, uh, because um, uh, attempts to engage in regulatory arbitrage didn't work, uh, and we were coordinated the entire way, uh, the communication was extraordinary, uh, and, and I can say from, from my view point, the, the level of trust is, ex is extraordinarily high. Uh, and the level of respect um, is extraordinarily high. And I, and I, view, I see us, even if we perhaps reach a different conclusion from time to time, that being, again, the exception and, uh, and, and unlikely to um, um, disrupt 
the work that we're doing one another because we respect our differences when they exist. Um, I think this holds true not just for international enforcers, but it holds true for state enforcers. Um, since um, coming into the Department of Justice, uh, the communication with our state enforcers has been um, extraordinarily valuable. We view them as equals. Uh, we um, are investing in building out uh, more infrastructure to support our relationship with the state attorneys general. In fact, uh, join, recently joining our front office was um, someone who graced this stage uh, not too long ago, Sarah Allen, uh, who is working alongside Matt Conforti for a building out a broad range at the Department of Justice to build out a broad range uh, level of cooperation and collaboration with our state enforcers. Um, so the, the message here is not one of divergence. The message here is one of convergence and cooperation, and it is sincere. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, Alex, I was wondering, we've read that you at Kaje have been entering into increasingly a number of uh, agreements, cooperation agreements with domestic colleagues uh, in other agencies, as well as internationally, and, and most recently, perhaps um, of note, uh, an agreement, an MOU, with uh, the Competition Commission of India. We're just wondering if you could give us a, a share a few thoughts about how that's been impacting on the cases that you're bringing in. How do you see that bearing fruit going forward? So, thank you. Um, it's, I, I tend to agree to Margaret and Contra. I mean, international cooperation is very important. We were in the same boat. We have to cooperate. and. Trustable is one thing that we need between agencies, and, and uh, a lot of cases is multi-jurisdictional and merging acquisitions and a lot of investigation as well. So, and Brazil has been doing a lot of MOUs with a lot of jurisdictions to try to exchange information, learn with them, uh, 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 bring to Brazil the best practices, and we have a lot of good examples of cases like that. Uh, with EEC, for example, uh, the uh, Alston, Simons and Alston case was very example, a very good example of uh, co international cooperation. And this one thing that uh, happened, uh, Brazil, uh, uh, that market in Brazil is a little bit different. The, the biggest problem was in Europe, not in Brazil, and have just a little market that we could apply in a remedy. But if we apply this remedy before EC, probably in the case we had a problem in Brazil, and we did a kind of uh, timing alignment and wait the hero of decision. So this kind of things uh, has to happen between agencies and it very, it's very important. With India as well, so India, the, the, big, the BRICS country, Russia, India, China, and South, South Africa and Brazil, we have to be also uh, very tight because our economy is very similar, it's a developing country. All, uh, the population is huge, Brazil is, uh, 250 million inhabitants, see how, how big is Russia and India. So it's a, a very big consumer market. And we, you, you know, we face the same problems. So uh, the international cooperation uh, between, um, among the BRICS is also very, um, very important. And one thing that Cantor highlight here is the cooperation has not to be just outside and abroad. Inside of our country is very special as well. We do um, a cooperation between institutions in Brazil, sign an MOU with uh, the sector agencies, uh, and we have a very good relationship with them and doing advocacy, you know, trying to help them to do the regulation. If the, regulate, uh, the regulation is pro or anti-competitive, and we can, uh, in advance, tell them, look, this is, could, be, uh, could, have, could be done in another way, so it's gonna be better for the market. So this, this kind of relation is, it's pretty good. And also, the, the relation with the um, uh, prosecution services in Brazil. Uh, Kaji has, I don't think that another agency has what, what, what Kaji has. We have a representative of the federal prosecutors at the Kaji Tribunal. So every case he can op uh, give his, his opinion and he's very close to us and help us to do the lenience program it's a kind of, at least for the antitrust cases, for cartel cases, it's one one-stop shop. So if we have a cartel, we don't have to go to the to the prosecutors and later to CAD. You just go to CAD, you call them, you sign thing to get, things together, and we also have immunity. If you sign the lenience with CAD, you have a criminal immunity, uh, and federal prosecutors cannot, you know, go on, go on with the cases. So these kinds of cooperation help us uh, 
to you know, uh, uh, increase our enforcement, give more transparency, do our job that it's really important for the society. I just have one more question on this topic of cooperation. Last year, a host of agencies, the FTC, the DOJ, uh, the European Commission, the state AGs, the Canadian Competition Bureau, uh, and the CMA announced the formation of a multilateral pharmaceutical working group. Uh, and Gwendolyn, I think you touched on this in your opening remarks, but just wondered if you could share any updates and any others to chime in afterwards if they'd like as well, please. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I will say, just to be boring and echo everything on the, that you've heard already, we really are getting along very well with our federal and international counterparts. And I would say this working group is a perfect example of that. Um, as I've said, healthcare is hugely important to the states. In fact, we have three different committees that addressed healthcare and pharmaceutical is issues within the antitrust task force at NAG. Each of those committees had a delegate to the multilateral pharmaceutical merger task force, um, where we've learned a lot. First, it was fascinating to hear from our counterparts across the globe, and useful even when we don't have the same law to see how we approach problems differently. We've also heard from a number of different stakeholders, including opinion leaders, industry, academics, the ABA, and yes, we read your comments. Thank you very much. Um, we are still learning about what works and what doesn't, and, and there are a lot of questions that we're still thinking about. As for the immediate impact, I think this exercise has helped frame the state's approach to our comments on the merger guidelines, as you will likely see soon, um, and as we develop our thoughts on remedies and market definition, amongst other things. So the states are really looking forward to distilling and implementing the lessons we've learned going forward. And I hope to see more developments from this group soon. Anybody else have, want to chime in, Lena or others, on the, the multilateral pharmaceutical working group? Or we can move on to the next topic. I would just um, quickly echo um, everything Gwendolyn just shared. It's been a really fantastic experience. And I think a good example of an area where we're really trying to understand how to narrow the gap between um, how we might be currently sometimes viewing some of these pharma mergers in particular and how industry analysts might be anticipating the effects of these transactions. And so the more that we can be talking to market participants, um, I think the more that we can be learning and figuring out how to make sure that that new learning is informing our, our analysis. So it's been a great effort so far and, and looking forward to the continuation of it. Thank you. Why don't we move on to a new topic, a, a very new topic of, of new legislation. Competition, consumer protection, privacy legislation is continuing to circulate in the U.S. legislatures, making even bolder strides in Europe and elsewhere. Margareta, why don't we start by talking about the recent developments involving the, the Digital Markets Act. Can you give our uh, participants here and the people watching on the streaming service um, an update on who's going to be covered by the DMA, what the prohibitions will be, and can you also talk more broadly about the problems that the Digital Markets Act is really intending to address? So for example, why is there a concern with data being used across services? Why is there a concern with, with self-preferencing? Well, how long do you have? <laughs> we have an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, because here, you know, we are, we, we are quite excited, uh, I must say. And, uh, and not only us, but also uh, one of the features of the Digital Markets Act is that we will, uh, well, the Commission will be the sole decision maker, but we work very closely with the national competition authorities in, in all member states. Uh, because this is going to be resource intensive uh, to get it right. So we're looking very much forward uh, for the national competition authorities and for us. Uh, to make the most of the market insights, of the resources we have available, uh, to make sure that we are effective on ground. Uh, because obviously the success of a piece of legislation is in its uh, enforcement. Uh, the aim is really, really simple, to have open, fair, contestable markets. And that's of course suggesting that may not be the case as we speak. Uh, because in, in the first uh, mandate, you know, I had had not one, not two, but three Google cases, a couple of Amazon cases. And, uh, and what we saw was that within the specifics of a case, 
uh, well, we could s stop illegal behavior, we could see things maybe markets starting to recover, but no sort of general learning. Uh, and when we did the sector inquiry into the consumer internet of things, uh, we saw exactly the same things that we had been going after before. And now we just heard about another Google shopping case uh, with the Brazil authorities. We here have the ADs, they are looking into a number of digital issues. So we realized by the end of the last mandate that we're onto something systemic here. So we needed something to come, you know, uh, enable the, the, the rigor of the specific case law uh, and, and case enforcement to be more broad. Uh, broadly uh, useful, useful. So here comes the, the DMA. And uh, the European Parliament and the Council, they maintain sort of the main structure uh, of the proposal. Uh, and the dynamics uh, will be that if you meet a certain uh, set of thresholds that are being shaped by our understanding of what is a dominant market position, then you will be a designated gatekeeper. Being a designated gatekeeper, you'll have to live up to a set of do's and don'ts. So one do could be that you need to give people their own data. Uh, we have the specifics of the Amazon case right now, where small retailers do not have access uh, to you know, high quality, rich data about the business that they do on the platform. Amazon retail may have that access to the benefit of Amazon retail. Here, Obvious, we find that you know, the small retail, they should have their data in order to improve their business. So that would be an obvious do. Uh, an obvious don't uh, would be a ban on self-preferencing. Uh, the Google Shopping case is the most obvious example, um, but we get a lot of people who are not really comfortable uh, in other verticals. But they say, well, it may be fine now, but we have this sense that we could basically be turned off like this if self-preferencing gets started. So I think this is, this is an obvious ban uh, in order to make sure that those who are in these marketplaces, well, they can be there uh, safe and sound. Uh, we consider this a, a pro-innovation piece of legislation uh, because for some of these smaller businesses, um, it should depend on on their ideas, on their work ethics, on their access to funding, if they get to their customer. It should not depend on someone who's keeping the gates to their market. So it becomes much more attractive to invest because the gatekeeping uh, is basically stopped. It depends on you whether you're successful uh, uh, or have the chance of being it, not on, on some third party. So I, I think that is, uh, it's really an important takeaway that this is pro-innovation, and it puts responsibility where responsibility is due. Uh, because there's no ban of success in Europe, that is not on the do's or don'ts list, and you can be really successful. But with success comes market power, and with that market power comes responsibility. And this is what we express in the do's and don'ts list. Uh, we're really looking forward to get started. Uh, now the, the council and, and parliament will finalize the formalities. So it will be in our official journal around 1st of October, come into effect 20, 22nd of October. Uh, and then, you know, the formalities are there. But we start talking already now with businesses who think that they might be uh, in, in scope. I don't know, as I speak, uh, who they will be. My guess is uh, a number of US uh, companies maybe a couple of Chinese, maybe a couple of European companies as well. Uh, and we have open doors, you know, come and talk to us to see, well, what do you think? Uh, how, how would you live up to this? But, but we do think that uh, compliance should be in place by early 2024. Thank you. Lena, what about in the US? Do you think we need new legislation here? You know, there are a few areas that are top of mind. Um, I think for the FTC in particular, we need a fix to Section 13B of the FTC Act uh, to ensure that we can seek equitable monetary relief in federal court, including restitution and disgorgement. Um, and so this would really be addressing the fallout from the Supreme Court's AMG decision last year 
which has had serious ramifications for the FTC, uh, effectively eliminating billions of, of dollars of relief that we would have been able to secure for Americans. And so it's incredibly important that we get a fix. Um, another area that to my mind seems ripe for revisiting is the HSR Act. Um, I think specifically the 30-day timelines that we see in HSR really reflect um, lawmakers anticipating a much smaller set of deals that the agencies would be reviewing. Um, so interestingly, some of the House reports from that time so show that, that lawmakers thought that HSR would really cover around 150 transactions annually, whereas the agencies now you know, routinely get that number of filings every two weeks. And I think when you add on top of that just the, the degree to which the investigative process has become much more um, you know, document heavy and, and much more onerous and much more complex, um, that 30-day timeline is oftentimes not enough for our, our staff to be able to thoroughly investigate uh, those deals. Um, I think, you know, another aspect of HSR that's uh, worth looking at is uh, the filing fees. Um, you know, the, the law basically uh, requires that uh, filing threshold, it basically ensuring that the, as we see an increase in deal volume, that the filing fees are also increasing would ensure that we're able to keep pace uh, with some of the cycles that we see in the deal volume. And I think the, the, the absence of that uh, was, was extremely acute for us over the last year. You know, more generally, I think it's, it's no secret that the courts have narrowed the zone of liability, um, especially in the context of the Sherman Act, which I think has chilled enforcement in ways that lawmakers increasingly seem troubled by. I think a whole host of the proposals that we've seen out of Congress are very interesting. And I think as a general matter, greater reliance on presumptions and, and bright line rules are important. And I think a shift away from them in a whole set of contexts has had serious costs. I think in the context of the Sherman Act, uh, we see a whole set of decisions that have cabined the law in ways that no longer may no longer be fit for purpose, uh, be it in the context of, of tying, of predatory pricing, uh, of efforts to collapse attempted monopolization into monopolization, uh, or the kind of growing expansion of uh, Trinco in all sorts of domains, even though the holding in Trinco was, was quite narrow. Um, so I think you know those are a set of areas where um, lawmakers already seem interested, but I think additional attention is warranted. Um, lastly, I, I would say that you know private enforcement of antitrust has been historically a key complement to public enforcement. Right, One reason why there's a, a private right of action is because lawmakers imagine that there would be a symbiotic relationship between private and public enforcers. And so I think areas in which courts have made it very difficult for private plaintiffs to proceed um, could be another area worth revisiting. Uh, in particular, the kind of judge-made doctrine around antitrust injury has introduced requirements um, that I think in practice can just make it extremely onerous uh, for private cases to proceed. Um, and then lastly, one area that we're also thinking about is opportunities to be expanding whistleblower protections um, in the antitrust context. Uh, presently, uh, whistleblowing in the antitrust context is, is not fully protected at the FTC, and I think this could be especially crucial in the Section 2 context where dominant firms, you know, may have the ability to strike fear among business partners and their employees, and so allowing those types of whistleblower protections uh, could be quite critical for us to be able to get information in a quick and timely way. Thanks. You know, one pending piece of legislation is the American Innovation and Choice Online Act, which was reported out by the Judiciary Committee in January. That uh, uh, proposed bill would, among other things, prohibit big tech companies from self-preferencing their own products and services on their platforms. Um, the Wall Street Journal recently reported that the DOJ had, sit, had submitted a letter to the House and Senate leadership backing the bill. So, uh, Jonathan, is the legislation necessary, and what, if anything, would you suggest to improve it? Sure, so thank you for that. And first, let me congratulate our uh, colleagues in the EC on a heroic feat, um, uh, which is passing the DMA. It was um, a tremendous effort, uh, including by uh, the executive price, uh, the vice president, who I believe is to your left, uh, and, and, and her team uh, to get that over the finish line. It was, it was no small task and uh, an extraordinary effort and a, a significant step forward. Uh, I also want to echo the comments of, of Chair Khan. Uh, but let me um, also want to key off of before I answer your direct question on one thing that, um, that Margreta said that, that I really truly believe is so important to emphasize 
And that is what we're talking about here, competition policy, antitrust enforcement, it's good for business. Right? We're not, we're, in my experience, the only company that doesn't like antitrust enforcement or competition enforcement is the monopoly. What we're talking about is providing opportunity for competition, opportunity to succeed, opportunity to innovate, uh, and that's what we're protecting. And, and in my view, uh, and this is something actually Robert Jackson himself uh, emphasized uh, when he was uh, um, Assistant Attorney General of the Antitrust Division uh, many decades ago, that uh, businesses should want enforcement. They should want the opportunity to compete. Um, let me switch a little bit to your direct question, uh, which is yes, the DOJ did send a letter to the Senate um, and the House expressing uh, our strong support for the, Amer for, the, uh, for the American Innovation and Choice Online Act uh, and, and the uh, similar act in the House of Representatives. Um, digital markets have transformed our economy in ways that would have been almost unimaginable um, decades ago, uh, even, even 15 years ago. Uh, this important legislation, in our view, would clarify the legality of anti-competitive and exclusionary discrimination by dominant digital platforms. As more and more of our economy becomes digital, clear standards on anti-competitive discrimination are increasingly important. And this legislation will help us ensure that entrepreneurs and other innovators can access markets free from dominant incumbents that impede competition and innovation. The legislation would also help enforcers prevent the harms from anti-competitive discrimination. The antitrust division is committed to using all the tools that Congress gives us to protect and promote competition. And it's our view in a full-throated way that this new legislation will supplement our existing antitrust enforcement authority and serve as an important new tool for the division and others to use to protect the dynamism of digital markets. Um, and so the, the, the fact remains that um, the rules of business are changing, the way business operates is changing, the economics of business is changing. Uh, and it's important for us to keep pace. Congress certainly has the prerogative to clarify uh, what it believes the appropriate enforcement tools should look like, uh, and it is our job to enforce the law as they write it. Um, that having been said, uh, even with the laws that we have on the books today, it is extremely important and imperative that we uh, in the federal um, antitrust realm um, uh, in, in the Department of Justice uh, enforce the law fully in a way that matches market realities. Uh, and it's extremely important that we recognize the fundamental ways in which uh, the rules of business have changed, the technology has changed, the economics incentives have changed, and to make sure we're keeping pace. Thanks. Lena, anything you'd care to add on that one? I would just um, echo a lot of what Jonathan said. I mean, look, I think the it's it's really been a remark remarkable to see the set of important proposals coming out of the House and coming out of the Senate over the last few years. Uh, in many instances, these are bipartisan proposals. And I think what we see more generally is a really critical reassertion of Congress in the domain of antitrust. I think there, there was a period of, of time where Congress ended up taking a back seat. And I think that the, the fact that Congress is now reasserting itself really underscores the degree to which there's now wide bipartisan agreement that there are serious problems um, in the, the current you know, narrowing of the law and some of the ways in which they might not be reaching new contexts such as digital markets. And so I would just say that it's been remarkable to see um, the progress in Congress in both the House and Senate, and it's an incredibly exciting time across the board. Thanks. Gwendolyn, there's also activity in state legislatures raising, ranging from privacy and data protection statutes to state merger control statutes, um, at the risk of asking you to summarize the developments among 52 plus <laughs> enforcers. Um, what should we know about what's happening on that front? Well, I think as we've heard on this panel, you know, where state legislatures see gaps in the enforcement scheme, they are also passing laws. So the three-legged stool of antitrust enforcement is designed to provide some redundancy in the system, and that is a feature and not a bug. It provides consistency for business, and consistency for the enforcement community. Um, like I've said, we have a great partnership with our colleagues in the federal government, and we work collaboratively whenever possible. However, the states are separate sovereigns, and so when something concerns our state interests, we investigate or litigate as appropriate, as you can see in the generic drugs case, the Suboxone case, and as you could see from the states that litigated the T-Mobile case. 
And this is especially true when we're enforcing our own laws. So on merger notification laws, I hope you were able to attend the excellent drinking from the legislative fire hose panel yesterday, because I think that's what's going on. Um, they talked about this a lot in great depth, but just to summarize at a high level, a number of states have enacted HSR laws, or laws that make HSR notice more straightforward, particularly on healthcare-related transactions, including Washington State, Nevada, Oregon, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. And more state legislatures are considering HSR notice statutes beyond just healthcare. So if you practice merger work, you need to pay attention to which states are affected by your transaction, as the fines in some states for noncompliance are severe and calculated by day. A best practice for deal lawyers, contact the AG in your affected state. Let them know about your transaction. We're not going anywhere, so ignoring us doesn't work anymore. As for privacy, Utah recently joined California, Virginia, and Colorado in creating a Consumer Privacy Act. Utah's bill takes a slightly uh, more narrow approach to earlier laws. And by contrast, a little more stringent, Virginia's act provides consumer data privacy rights, including a right of access, amongst other things. This was covered on the Hot Topics panel yesterday, which I hope you saw. There are debate um, among state legislators across the country about the scope of the law. Um, and so a number of states continue to take a look at those issues, including my home state of Wisconsin. So you will likely need to watch this space if you're pr practicing privacy law as well. Thanks. Alex, any developments in Brazil we should know about? Yeah, we have, uh, I mean, our law, it's just uh, turning 10 years old right now. But it's still, um, I think that we're still um, having uh, our toolkit to, you know, handle and, and have enforcement. But for sure, we, we do have room for, you know, more changes and improve the, uh, the law. And we have some views in Congress that change for, change for example, the way that we apply, we apply fines. There is a big, in, a big discussion in Brazil about the amount if we do or not have the enforcement, and if, if our fine is lower than it should be, uh, because the law says that we have to consider the damage, and we have the discussion about the methodology to how to calculate the damage. And, and this, for example, um, we are trying to change this in, 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 in the Congress to give more transparency and to be more clear and more secure for the parties and people that are being accused and how CAD will uh, 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 judge and, and, and apply the fines. In terms of big tax and, and, and digital market, the structure of CAD is a little bit different. We don't, we don't do in CAD, CAD is just about emerging acquisitions, cartels, the abuse of dominance. We don't do consumer protection, data protection. We don't, um, it's, it's a little bit different from FTC and, and DOJ. Uh, and we have, recently uh, create um, a new uh, data protection authority in Brazil, and also uh, a data protection law that, uh, you know, it's giving the directions uh, about how big tax and how those, those kind of environment has to behave. And what Kaji used, I mean, tried to do is, uh, have very good, a very good relationship with them because you know th there is a very big intersection between competition and data protection, and we don't want to uh, also get in their role, but also we need their collaboration to to uh, run our cases here. Thanks. So shifting a little bit, um, so what's being called the neo brandeisian movement seems to be moving beyond um, the circles of academia and think tanks uh, to take a, a real hold at the U.S. enforcers. Um, you can see I get the easy questions. Um, Jonathan, um, I was hoping uh, you could give us some sense of, you know, whether there's cases uh, that you've brought or the division uh, is in the course of bringing that you think are a good fit uh, for the focus on the competitive process as opposed to the immediate consumer harm. Uh, that uh, some would consider to be the hallmark of this movement. Great. So um, let me start by saying that I think um, the use of labels is often um, designed to divide, divide uh, rather than unite. And I think um, 
I want to be very clear here that you know what we're talking about is antitrust enforcement in a way that's consistent with the statute as written by Congress here in the United States. And so to answer your question, Melanie, all of them, right? The, what we're talking about here is making sure that we are protecting competition. Why? Because competition yields a wide range of benefits. It benefits workers, it benefits consumers, it benefits um, small business growth, it benefits innovation, it benefits democracy. Um, and so all of the cases we're bringing are designed to protect competition and designed to protect the competitive process. Uh, and all the cases that we will bring will be designed to achieve the same result. Why? Because that's what Congress wrote in its law. Uh, and that's, um, and, and our job is to enforce the law as it's written and follow the facts in the law wherever it may lead. That's a very compelling answer to me. I mean, I think if we drill down maybe a little bit, um, Lena, I'm hoping maybe uh, you could help us understand maybe a little bit more on the particulars. So in the US, and I can say this as a Canadian, uh, Switzerland, whatever I might be, um, so please take it in the spirit it's intended with its genuine curiosity. Um, you know, even if you want to bring cases that are based on the tenets of the movement, um, to the extent you accept that there is one, um, you know, what can, what, are, what can you do given the sort of the state of the case law? I, is Section 5 a big part of the answer, either through adjudication or rulemaking? And what do you do given some of the um, precedents you have from your Supreme Court about exclusive dealing standards, predatory pricing standards, uh, or even uh, the Philadelphia National Bank standard in the context of mergers? Yeah, thanks for the question, and I would echo um, a lot of what Jonathan uh, noted around, you know, this effort really being around protecting competition and in the context of the FTC, protecting fair competition, uh, given that our statute prohibits unfair methods of competition. I think, you know, it's, it's an important question, and I think the reality is that case law is not meant to be static, right? It's, it's meant to evolve as the facts and the underlying realities require. And it's reasonable to think that standards introduced in the 80s um, or 70s might not stand the test of time if the ways that firms are doing business, if the underlying features of how certain markets are functioning, if their core characteristics and the capabilities and incentives that they create have dramatically changed. And so I think that the challenge that enforcers face in particular today is really making sure that we are taking steps to, to push the law so that it is actually reflecting the underlying market realities and so that we're not seeing a gap between what the law is requiring but the, and the business practices that we're seeing in the marketplace. Um, I'd also say more generally, um, I think you know there's a whole set of instances in which certain cases remain good controlling law um, that the agencies have an opportunity and actually a mandate uh, to follow. Um, and that's something that the, both uh, the DOJ and, and the FTC plan to do uh, very closely. I think you know one of the areas where we see um, this potential gap is, is predatory pricing analysis, right? So, so I think Matsushita and Brook Group offer a fairly dim view of, of the likelihood that firms will engage in predatory pricing. Uh, the courts in those cases effectively say predatory pricing is an irrational business practice because you're losing money without any guarantee of recouping it. The moment you attempt to raise prices, you'll see a flood of new entrants that come and discipline the firm. And so it's a high cost strategy with low probability of success. And that skepticism has led courts to impose in a recruitment element, which in practice has led successful predatory pricing cases to plummet. So what we have here is a, is a doctrine that has baked within it a particular descriptive account of how markets work um, and a business strategy. I think in the digital context, for example, we've seen the way in which network externalities, data feedback loops, um, other specific features of digital markets in particular, reward certain business strategies designed to capture the market as quickly as possible. Uh, we also see there can be significant entry barriers such that once the market has tipped, when it, once a firm has captured the entire market, that entry uh, that, that the doctrine assumes will come and discipline the firm might not occur. And so I think you know that's just one example of, of where we meet, might see that type of gap such that it's incumbent on the agencies uh, to really be showing to the courts uh, ways in which we may need the law to evolve to, to better match some of the realities that we're seeing. Gwendolyn, uh, can the states do anything uh, under state law to expand or change the substantive reach of antitrust and competition law? So I would say from a litigation perspective, I mean, short of a legislative change or a shift in how courts think about our cases, we recognize that we need to prove what courts want us to prove. So while state law is largely implemented and interpreted consistently with federal antitrust law, 
There is some variation and has been for decades. Um, those of you who are familiar with Illinois brick repealers, right? Those allow indirect purchasers to seek damages in states like Wisconsin and many others. On labor issues, we, some states make non-competes presumptively unlawful or strongly disfavor them. Um, and then, of course, there are the proposed amendments to the Donnelly Act, the 21st Century Antitrust Act, um, which would, as Chair Khan was talking about, really you know, modify and expand to what some might argue, address some of the issues that New York is seeing, including creating a comprehensive merger notification requirements for all mer mergers over the very precise $9.2 million figure, um, as well as some other issues, including prohibiting abuse of dominance for companies, high market shares, which Margaret is familiar with, um, and the bill would not allow pro-competitive benefits to be used to offset harm where there's an abuse of dominance. So we'll all be watching what happens there. Um, Alex, is any of this really taking hold um, outside the U.S., either through this paradigm uh, or, or otherwise? Yes, this is the big discussion right now, and you can feel this in Brazil. Um, the, it is undeniable that the new Brandeisian approach has been gained a lot of importance uh, those days. The idea of spending the objectives of the antitrust policies beyond the consumer welfare standard towards the reduction of, for example, poverty and inequality, environment, sustainability, and other consideration is not something entirely new. We know that. But uh, uh, it's, it's again being defended by some, um, some pra practitioners, scholars, politicians, and especially in countries, in, in, in developing countries, because you have a lot of social problems as well. So this can be, uh, this is actually a very uh, important issue that we're discussing over there. But uh, Kaji, as I told you, has a kind of different approach because of the structure uh, and because of the law. And we keep staying a little bit more conservative in a, in a sense that uh, watching what's happened around the world, we know that we're not leading the world, but we can be here like sitting and watch what United States and Europe is doing to learn with the best practice and also with the mistakes. Uh, and, but we know the importance of, of the dynamic markets right now. And uh, we do in Brazil like case by case. Uh, we have the same, uh, a lot of, uh, cases that is very similar that you have here in the United States, for example, uh, no posting uh, agreements and uh, uh, wage fixing, but we're still looking to the consumer and to, do, to the welfare standard. We think that if you open the objective, we're gonna have decisions more abstract and probably uh, not, so, um, um, not so technical in terms of uh, and, I, and I trust. What I'm saying that is not inequality, poverty, sustainability is not important. It is, it is very important, but I think that there is better uh, people to do this than I trust guys. I mean, it's very hard to take care about the, the, the two kids that we have already. Uh, imagine, uh, you know, uh, put for inside of our analysis, sustainability, for example. And I, I just wanna give an example important that happened in Brazil. We had a case that a big company, minority company, uh, uh, I don't know if you follow this in the newspaper, but like three years ago, was a completely tragedy in Brazil. Uh, it was, had a, a dump uh, full of rejects, and suddenly this dump like, broke and went all over the city and destroyed the city. Uh, and one week later, that same company notified Kaji uh, with another, uh, buying another company that has another dump in the same city. So and the discussion was, <laughs> is this company uh, compliant with the environment? And what should it do in Kaji? Take this in account and block the deal or just look for the competition issue, because the competition issue was a fast track in Kaji. 
So what CAD did was strain the mainstream analysis and say, okay, this is not my problem, it's important, there is other institution that can hold this, and let's, you know, approve the case. So this is uh, uh, the way that you have been uh, analyzing merchant acquisitions in Brazil. And also another example, a bank was buying another one, and the discussion was about the efficiency. At the end of the day, the efficiency was fire thousands of people. And this is, was the argument that uh, we take in a consideration to, uh, to approve the deal. So, that's it. No, appreciate no, Melanie, may I just also add one, one note here? Because um, the consumer welfare standard is something that gets a lot of discussion uh, in, in narrow antitrust circles. And I think it's important, um, something I'd like to address, which is that, um, in my, in my experience, if you ask five antitrust lawyers, what does the consumer welfare standard mean, you will get six different answers. And, and so the whole idea of something being a standard is for there to be agreement as to what it means. And I think we're sitting here now 30, 40 years later, um, uh, and there's still no agreement as to what it means. I was just lo looking on Twitter, forgive me for doing that the other day, and a number of well-respected antitrust scholars were still debating the same. Is it total welfare? Is it total surplus? Is it consumer surplus? Is it consumer welfare? What does it mean? What's the economic definition? What's the legal definition? That is not a standard, right? Um, and so I think we have to start going back to first principles. Let's look at the language of the statute. Let's look at the intent of the statute. If the goal is to protect competition in the competitive process, that's what we ought to do. And the benefits of competition um, and the harms from corporate concentration can be widespread. And that's the goal of the antitrust laws. That's how it's written on its face, is written by our Congress here in the United States. Uh, and that should be our guiding principle. Uh, but um, you know, we can have this broader conversation, this academic discussion about consumer welfare. But I'd like to point out that it, 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 there, it's, it can, something is not a standard unless there's broad-based agreement as to what it means. So uh, appreciating that there are different philosophical histories and as you say, Jonathan, um, even interpretations within one, uh, different rules and different processes depending on your jurisdiction and different models. Um, Margarita, I was hoping you could uh, share with us, you know, how's this discussion taking shape in Europe? Well, I, I really like uh, like the the approach here in uh, in our roundtable uh, because it's pragmatic, it's hands-on, it's getting things done, uh, not being captured uh, in in sort of a labeling discussion. Because I think that Jonathan is is really right to say that very often labeling discussions uh, they are uh, diversive uh, discussions. Uh, you have this belief, so you're not with me, uh, and you know we have things to do. We're in a hurry. Uh, I think the, the, the cases uh, just mentioned shows that it's really, really important to focus our resources um, on, on, on what we, we have uh, in front of us. And in a European perspective, you know, uh, for, 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 for decades, uh, uh, the European competition law enforcement have been focusing on protecting an effective uh, competitive process competition on the merits. Uh, that is sort of our, our mantra, this is, uh, this is what we do. And, and the courts uh, have consistently confirmed this, uh, that this is what we are uh, supposed, uh, supposed to do. In, uh, in Continental Can, the court maintained that the purpose of enforcement of uh, a 102, uh, which was not only aimed at protecting consumers from, from direct harm, uh, also uh, indirect harm, uh, we could stem from conducts uh, that have an impact on the competitive structure of the market uh, could, be, could be pursued. So I think it has been clear uh, for us that protecting consumer welfare, uh, that can be achieved by, um, by enabling and protecting the process of, of competition. And, and that has led us uh, to have some, I think, quite, uh, for us, interesting discussions about when that is our fundamental, then how to make sure that we are relevant in digital age. So I had uh, the special advisors uh, coming up with their report. Uh, we had a number of 
of uh, public consultations, and that sort of led to the process of, of the Digital Markets Act to, to remain relevant. Uh, because as, as Lena just said, uh, if the market has tipped, well, do we see a new entrant? No, actually we don't. It has changed market reality, and that is a reality of, of, uh, of digital markets. So, so that was one consideration, how to, with our fundamentals, to remain relevant in a digital age. We answered that with, uh, with the Digital Markets Act, and of course in our enforcement practices, getting new uh, competences on board, being more uh, data savvy, uh, working with, uh, with other agencies who, who can bring their competences for us to fully understand what goes on in the market. And, and most recently, we have been working um, with the stakeholders and very intensely with national competition authorities on how to remain relevant with our fundamentals in mind uh, in, in an era where we have to fight climate change, where sustainability in the broadest uh, meaning of, of the word is, uh, is really, really essential. Uh, I really agree that uh, antitrust and, and competition law enforcement is not sort of the silver bullet in fighting climate change, um, then we would not be sitting here because the planet is burning. Um, but it could play a role. Uh, and, and the reason why I agree is that very often, you know, just for the legislator to regulate, to say, well, this is how to deal with it, that would be the obvious way to go. But maybe there are some things that we can do. Uh, so we have been discussing that intensively among ourselves and national competition authorities, bringing a lot to the table. Now we're just ready for businesses to come forward. Because what has been difficult in our discussion and in what we want to do to enable also businesses to do more for sustainability is lack of cases. Lack of companies coming forward saying, we would like to do more. Can you give us comfort that you will not come knocking and say this was all wrong. Uh, so if you know someone, mm -hmm. then give them my number. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> in the US, there's a sense that there are some new sheriffs in town. Um, but maybe nobody is really very sure what the new rules are. So the FTC has withdrawn the vertical merger guidelines. And while the DOJ hasn't, people kind of think that DOJ doesn't think that the vertical merger guidelines are really an accurate reflection of the way they think about vertical mergers now. Um, the horizontal merger guidelines will be revised, but nobody's quite sure where they're headed either. Um, the Treasury Department came out with a report on labor markets that notes that the guidance for human resources professionals is being revised and that what the DOJ and the FTC previously said about information exchanges may no longer reflect current thinking. Um, there's been talk of criminal enforcement of Section 2, but we really don't know what kinds of conduct might be targeted criminally. So th there are lots of unknowns, and I wanted to give you a chance to, to break some news here if you'd be willing to. Can you provide any guidance on, on what we should expect? Um, Lena, maybe we'll start with you. Sure, happy to. I mean, I'll just say up front, you know, I think it's fair to say that we presently see broad reassessment of the antitrust laws and their efficacy, right? This is bigger than the antitrust enforcers. This is a national conversation. It's in many ways a global conversation. And so anytime you have these moments of reassessment, there can be feelings of uncertainty, which is very understandable. Um, but to my mind, I think these types of reassessments are a good thing. Um, it's healthy and, and I'd argue necessary to periodically reassess what is working, what isn't working, and to keep what is working and, and think about how to improve what isn't. Um, I think this type of exercise is really critical to ensuring that our legal regimes are effective and retain credibility. And overall, as we undertake some of these reassessments, one key goal is actually to provide more certainty over the long term. I think, you know, outside of the per se context, I think it's very fair to say that antitrust law in the U.S. is not currently a model of, of certainty and predictability. Um, and to my mind, there are at least two ways to, to respond to that, right? One is to say, okay, well, some of the ambiguity in the law compels in favor of under enforcement, with the goal being you create certainty by doing less or only going after the worst of the worst offenders or, or just small players. Um, and the other is to say the way forward is instead to attempt to proactively clarify the law. Um, and that's the route that, that we're taking. 
Um, I think our efforts to revisit the merger guidelines is one example of this, where certain aspects of the guidelines can be quite ambiguous in ways that can create uncertainty in the business community and can risk inconsistent uh, enforcement. One of the key lines of inquiry for us, for example, in the merger RFI is to consider whether we need to be relying more on presumptions, for example, which, which can create some of that certainty. Um, we're also trying to get a better sense of areas where there might be gaps between the guidelines and what controlling law is, such that we can make sure that we're hewing to that law and, and provide greater certainty in that way. And so I think the, the goals of, of providing more certainty and predictability are very much central to a lot of these efforts. I think it's, it's only natural that uh, in some of these you know, interim periods, there can be uncertainty, but I think the effective enforcement of the law over the long term requires that, that certainty. Thanks. Jonathan, anything to add? Sure. Yeah, um, it's funny that you're actually like looking at me um, and I'm to the, you're right, and I'm looking at you straight ahead. It's just this very 2022 moment. Um, so um, <laughs> let me start by saying I echo everything that Lena just said. There is a global conversation. You're witnessing it here in front of you in real time. Uh, and so change sometimes means things have to change sometimes means there will be some uncertainty, but we're going about the process, in my view, with radical transparency. Uh, and so let me give you some examples. I've been in, at the Department of Justice now a little over four months. Uh, in that time, I've provided, I did a speech to the New York State Bar Association, remarks uh, at merger guidelines conference, remarks at a labor conference, remarks last week in Brussels. Earlier this week, the FTC and the, uh, and the DOJ hosted uh, an international antitrust enforcement summit, which we live stream to the public for free. Uh, today, we're, uh, at our insistence, uh, we are live streaming this panel to make sure that, um, that our um, views that we're expressing are available widely to the public, not just to a small set of, um, of, of practitioners. And that's transparency in, in the real sense. In terms of guidance, my suggestion is look what we're saying and look what we're writing. We filed um, a number of uh, important amicus briefs, uh, including New York v. Facebook. We, fired, we filed at the NLRB relating to worker misclassification. We filed statements of interest relating to uh, non-solicit, no poach agreements. Um, and uh, we are out there talking um, about our views in real time. We are also expanding the scope of the people we're talking to, right? And this is something that I think is getting overlooked. Um, and certainly um, may not be a welcome development um, from uh, certain folks in the antitrust bar, but, but what we're doing is we're not providing special access um, and, and from, um, from folks who can afford, only folks who can afford it uh, or can hire uh, 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 expensive lawyers. We are out there talking to the public. We're expanding the scope of our conversations. We're talking to affected stakeholders. Um, the FTC is holding public, uh, uh, open public meetings uh, and inviting anybody to show up to offer their concerns. We've solicited comments on the merger guidelines. We have already over 400. I'm sure many of which have come from folks in the room which are welcome. We are going to review them. We are reviewing them. We're doing comments on our bank merger guidelines. We're doing comments relating to, um, uh, to intellectual property. We are out there having that conversation, uh, but it's extremely important for us to have that conversation in a way that provides access to justice uh, for uh, all uh, interested stakeholders. Thanks very much. Anybody else want to chime in or otherwise I'll hand it over to Melanie. Alrighty then. Um, so the DOJ, the FTC, uh, KJ, and the states um, have been focused, as we've all been reading a lot about, uh, on labor-related issues. So from uh, no-poach uh, agreements to a focus on employee non-competes uh, to the impact of mergers on labor markets. You know, in a sense, one could question whether it's really a new way of thinking about antitrust law. Uh, certainly, um, there were ways in which this initiative started taking shape in those terms under the Obama administration uh, with the high-tech cases, uh, and then it expanded uh, in the Trump administration into the criminal and merger enforcement areas. Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Lena. Um, you know, what do you think about whether this animated interest in labor markets uh, is becoming an international trend? I mean, I can speak for, you know, at the FTC, um, this is certainly something that we are 
looking at very closely, um, thinking about the ways in which monopolization and unlawful deals hurt all sorts of market participants, uh, including workers, is something that we've been prioritizing. Um, and it's something that our teams are already beginning to look at in the context of merger investigations. Um, recently, in our uh, challenge to uh, the Lifespan New Care England uh, hospital transaction, uh, Commissioner Slaughter and I you know, wrote separately to note that we would have also supported a labor account in the complaint. Um, and that was in part because our staff did a fantastic job um, investigating that part of the market as well. So I think it's something that you know, is, is well underway um, at the FTC and is something that we're continuing to um, you know, explore. I think more generally, you know, there is an international conversation. Uh, we held, uh, along with the DOJ in partnership, an enforcer summit earlier this week that ended up being a really great vehicle for some of these conversations because I think in many ways, um, there are a whole set of, of shared challenges and shared questions that we're facing globally. And I think um, having these types of conversations, uh, you know, among enforcers at, for, with international enforcers as well as state enforcers is just a really important uh, way for us to be sharing collecting le collective learning um, and making sure that, you know, the, the sum is, uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, I think, you know, more generally, the, the set of empirical research that we've seen has really helped catalyze this conversation where there's been incredibly important economic research surfacing the ways in which uh, labor monopsony and monopsony power across markets can really have a detrimental effect. Uh, there was a really terrific report issued by the Treasury Department earlier this year um, showing that it can have a substantial material impact, leading wages to decline by up to 20%. So I think it's really incumbent on us as enforcers to be learning from that new evidence and making sure that we're enforcing the law so that workers are not at the short end uh, when we're seeing you know, monopolization or unlawful conduct. Uh, Jonathan, I'll, I'll try to look at you since you can then see me. Um, so, are, yeah, are you, should I look this way or which way? Um, just to, um, are you to my left or to my right here, Melanie? So, is that better? <laughs> um, let me let me let me say this: um, uh, labor issues are foundational to the work that we're doing at the Department of Justice and at the Antitrust Division. Foundational. So, um, we are right as we speak litigating. Uh, um, cases involving uh, involving uh, collusion uh, to suppress uh, wages and opportunities for workers to um, benefit from competition. Um, we ha have multiple cases, criminal cases, uh, that were started in the last administration and that we're continuing in this administration uh, that address criminal conduct that suppresses wages and opportunities to compete. We have many investigations underway. They're on the criminal side, they're on the civil side, they're on the merger side. We are also filing policy statements. We, I mentioned earlier the statement we filed at the NLRB relating to worker misclassification. Uh, we are filing statements of interest. I mentioned the case in Nevada uh, where uh, we filed in support of, of um, uh, non-competes regarding anesthesiologists. So these are issues that are so fundamental, competition benefits workers, period, full stop. And harm to competition uh, or comp uh, uh, reduction in competition uh, or anti-competitive agreements or anti-competitive practices that impact the ability of a worker to find a higher pay or a better job, there's nothing more important that we're doing. Um, this is, uh, uh, it is depriving through an anti-competitive agreement, merger or other conduct uh, the ability for a worker to move to another job, to get a better pay, to get better working conditions, that's the equivalent of stealing. Uh, and we are going to pursue that vigorously over and over and over again, and it is foundational to the work that we're doing. Gwendolyn, uh, what's the view from the states? Well, I will say, first of all, um, I neglected to mention earlier, but thank you, AAG Cantor, for your wonderful amicus brief in the Facebook case. We have really appreciated that. So thinking about labor issues, the states have been taking a comprehensive look at labor for a while now. Um, from New York's agreement with title insurer Old Republic in the last year with one of the nation's four largest title insurance companies to pay $1 million and terminate any existing no poach agreements, to Washington State's 225 commitments from corporate chains to eliminate no poach clauses from all franchise agreements nationwide. But we're not just in litigation. 
Pennsylvania has recently filed a, an amicus brief that successfully encouraged its highest court to strike down a business-to-business -business no poach or restrictive covenant agreement, which prohibited one business from agreeing with another to not poach each other's employees. I know Department of Justice has done those um, in the past. Um, and this is trying, you know, without informing those employees or getting their consent. So success there. I've talked about our NAG structure. We have a labor committee that's chaired by Maryland, Pennsylvania, and New York. This group has had productive conversations with some federal and international enforcers, both from the EU and from Canada, um, and amongst others, and we continue to actively monitor this issue. Many states, to what Chair Khan was saying, you know, many states are really considering new thinking in how we look at mergers. This is something that resonates a lot with the attorneys general because both in the evolution about the way that some states think about mergers and, and labor, because states are concerned about job losses, because those are citizens, and frankly voters, in our states. And we are considering, and not all states are of the same mind, but we're considering whether job losses would be considered an efficiency or whether they are, in fact, a harm. So I expect you will see some comments from the states on the upcoming merger guideline comments on this developing area of law. Alex, do you, uh, do you think there's a need to address labor markets with uh, new laws in Brazil? Yes, yes. Um, as we have expressed in other forums and, and debates such as OECD, for example, labor markets are becoming an emerging trend within the global competition agenda, and we can expect antitrust authorities to take um, a closer look um, in this domain. I understand that um, the premises um, of assessment centered on monopsony is instead of monopolies and market power of buyers, instead of market powers, instead of power of sellers, does not change the scope of antitrust uh, analysis, neither its core objective, which is the welfare uh, of final consumers, again. So, and we have a case in Brazil exactly like this. It was a collusion about uh, no poach uh, agreement and, and wage fixing. And the idea was the same. We know that if you uh, protect, protect um, competition and protect the consumers, we will protect also a lot of ancillary things. Uh, for example, uh, the, the, the workers. But the idea at the end of the day is not protect the workers. The idea in Brazil is protect the consumers. We have another institution to do this job in Brazil that is the Minister of Workers or another, uh, the federal prosecutors, or they can do this job. I think that's more effective if we uh, uh, protect competition, looking for the consumers, and ancillarily also we'll be benefiting the workers as well as we can do uh, with uh, other, other, other areas. As Margaret just said, I know we can do something, but I think that it's just the way that we have to read the consumer welfare standard. If I look at the end of the day for the consumers, maybe we protect other areas of, of, uh, of, of the country, but it's not necessary, it has to be the main goal of any trust. Thanks. Um, Jonathan, the division recently announced updates to its leniency policy and, and new FAQs. Can you uh, let the folks here and watching streaming know what we should take away from those changes? Sure. No, thank you for the question, I guess. Um, <laughs> does that work? <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, no, we're really, we're really pleased and proud of, of the work we're doing in this area. Um, and to build on my theme of transparency and access to justice, we are out there um, you know, trying to take rules that have often been unwritten rules or kind of insider rules and making sure that we're being very clear uh, in plain language to the entire public about um, what our position is on leniency. Um, and, and I think it's also important to talk about when, we, when we're talking about leniency, it, it, it's um, as a starting point, leniency is um, when somebody believes, when, when somebody has committed a crime, they come in for leniency. Right, And so we're starting from the premise that somebody has come in and committed a crime. And then we're saying, okay, well, you can avoid going to prison or being a convicted uh, felon uh, if you cooperate uh, and if you um, satisfy very high standards. 
Uh, those standards have existed for a very long time, uh, and now we're being very open about those standards. Um, but the fact of the matter remains that uh, the Lean C program is alive and well. Um, it's an important part of, of what we do. Um, type A leniency provides a tremendous range of benefits. Type A leniency is when we're not aware of a crime that has been committed. Uh, we've clarified what's necessary for type B leniency, which is when we're already investigating a crime and someone comes in. And what we're saying is, well, we're going to need to make sure that you're owning up to your end of the bargain. We need to make sure that you're not just giving back the money that you took um, through illegal behavior, criminal behavior, uh, but, uh, but, but that you are remediating, that you are ensuring this doesn't happen again, that you are, are cooperating fully to make sure that others are brought to justice. This is fundamental. It's consistent with the Justice Manual. It's consistent with um, uh, other areas of the Department of Justice, and, and we're, we're pleased to have brought that into focus. I've heard some criticisms. Folks say that, well, um, you know, you're, the, the carrot now is, is, is not as sweet. I'll say this. First, it's extremely sweet mm -hmm. if you come bring us uh, a leniency application in a matter where we're not currently aware of criminal behavior. Uh, and, and we want to strengthen that incentive. And, it, and it, in fact, we're, 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 the incentive is even greater now to make sure that you're going ahead and detecting con conduct in your company uh, and bring it to us early on. Um, second is uh, that, again, we're talking about a crime that's been committed. Um, and so uh, the, the carrot, the carrot is not going to prison. The carrot is not having a company be debarred because it's a convict, because convicted of a crime. Um, that carrot's quite significant. What we're saying is, um, one, that the rules need to be clear. They need to be expressed. They need to be equally available, whether um, you can hire a, a fancy law firm, like many in the audience, or whether you're, you're, you're not part of um, the antitrust establishment. Um, and what we're saying is that, um, that if you want to get this substantial benefit, you have to own up to your end of the bargain. And, um, and so we're making that clear, uh, and it's a choice. If you don't want to come in for leniency, you don't have to. Uh, but you should be very well aware that the consequences of not coming in and seeking leniency might mean prison time. It might mean massive fines and follow on liability. Uh, it might mean conviction of a crime. It might mean debarment. The criminal con the consequences for engaging in a crime are substantial, uh, and we're going to treat them as such. Thank you. Um, moving beyond traditional cartel cases, Last month, uh, Richard Powers created, let's, I think it's fair to say, quite a stir by indicating that criminal charges under Section 2 were among the, what he called, tools in the toolbox that the division would be considering employing. Uh, is there anything more you can tell us? Is the division really thinking about criminal Section 2 cases? And why now? You know, the division has not brought a large number of civil Section 2 cases, so why invoke criminal liability? Uh, will there be guidelines? What more can you tell us? Sure. No, I thank you for the question. So let me start by saying you're absolutely right. Uh, the division has not, in the last you know, 30 years, 20 years, brought uh, major um, Section 2 cases, right? Before US v. Google, the last major Section 2 case that was brought and litigated to a, um, a decision by the Department of Justice was US v. Microsoft, and that was filed in 1998. Um, so we've seen uh, Section 2 essentially um, get to a point where it was on life support. Uh, we are changing that. We're changing that mm. on the civil side. But let's not forget, Section 2, as Congress wrote it, was written as a criminal statute. It was a criminal statute starting in 1890. Um, it was a felony starting in, in the 1970s. Uh, and the penalties have been updated as recently in the 2000s. Um, so this is the will of Congress. This is how Congress wrote it. Uh, in terms of guidance, I guess what I would say right now is, um, there are a lot of talented lawyers out in the audience. I can't see them. I know many of them. Uh, my guidance is to read the cases. Um, and you'll, uh, I mean, there, there's over a century of case law relating to criminal antitrust enforcement of Section 1 and Section 2. Uh, and we will pursue criminal violations when the facts and the law suggest it's appropriate and consistent with the principles of federal pro criminal prosecution. Thanks, Jonathan. Margaretha? You know, I was 
it's um, just considering to, to add something as this question on, on leniency. Um, in, in, in Denmark, the, the youngsters who are in the final year of, uh, of their high school, they all have to write this giant essay. And, uh, and a question reached me, and it was a young uh, man writing on the trucks cartel. So he wanted to ask me this question, how can it be fair that a cartelist who's been cartelizing for such a long time with others got away scot-free? You know, what? And, um, and, and I, for, for me, it was important to express to him to say, well, leniency is a way of spreading and sowing distrust among cartelists. It's part of the mechanism. It's not a question about fairness. It's just to make sure that they can never trust one another. Eventually, one will turn in the others in order to get rid of the fine while the others will have to pay it. Uh, and this is why it's important to work on this being effective. Uh, so uh, in, in the important piece of legislation uh, that we passed a couple of years ago to, to strengthen the, the national competition authorities, also enabling employers uh, to know that they can come forward uh, without responsibility. Uh, the whistleblower um, facility that we have uh, established in a digital manner for people to come forward to us all of that important uh, in order for, uh, for leniency to work better. And um, also um, maybe showing people that, that this is not only in, in tech markets, this is also in traditional markets, and as we just discussed, it's also in, in labor markets. Uh, we also see the increased interest, and I think this is really good, but it's not a new thing. Uh, for us, it's completely plain vanilla also to look at labor markets. And I'm really proud of, uh, of the, effort, uh, the efforts done by, by the national competition authorities. Uh, the Hungarians have taken important decisions. Uh, the Finnish have taken uh, decisions. This was a, a local boycott, boycott of, uh, of a Finnish uh, hockey league uh, against one of the clubs, uh, not to hire, not to lend uh, players. Uh, we have investigations in Lithuania, the Netherlands, Poland, Portugal, uh, Romania. You know, I'm really proud of that work because it's close to people. They can see the effects uh, on ground. And, and I think that is exactly what we're talking about here, that transparency is not only in our processes. Transparency is also in the cases that we pick in order for people to see, uh, to understand for real that we're here to serve. And... Um, I don't know in, in what way this event may be a super spreader, uh, but I hope that you can feel that we're trying to spread a common message. <laughs> you wouldn't believe I planned this. Uh -huh. um, but, but it is quite interesting to see the level of trust between enforcers at all the different levels that we represent that competition law enforcement serves business, not the cartelist, not the monopolist, but that is pro-business, uh, the enforcement that we do. Because the huge majority of businesses, they're honest. They just work really hard to make a profit. And, and they want to have a fair chance out there. And the good news for all these honest businesses is that we work together and coordinate as close as possible to make it happen. Thank you. Um, Alex, we have only a few minutes left, but let me let you finish up our program by talking about cartel enforcement in Brazil. Seem, last year seems to have been an incredibly busy year. Is that the new normal? What should we be expecting in Brazil? Yeah, we have been uh, like, uh, facing an uh, increased number of cases. 2020 was a little down, but 2021, even uh, with the pandemic, we had we opened bunch of cases, we also judged 19, cart 19 cartel cases in Brazil. Also, merchant acquisitions, is, it's going up. And we can see the, also the, uh, the move about um, lenience programs around the world is going down in Brazil. We have the same numbers. Um, and I think that it's because uh, there is this kind of uh, uh, trustable uh, environment between 
uh, the private sector and the, and the interest agency about the, the quality of the program. So, and, and, but I think that one thing that is changing a lot is the way to investigate the cartels. This is, they don't do cartels like they used to do anymore, like sending an email and you know, combining price, okay, let's meet in somewhere and price is gonna be that. So we, we don't have this evidence anymore. We have algorithms, we have you know, a lot of technology behind that. We have uh, you know, tacit collusion and the challenge is how to deal with that, how to investigate and bring evidence to the cases and, 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 you know, and increase our enforcement. I think that's going to be the challenge for the next years. Thank you so much. We had a large list of other topics to talk about, uh, Section 5 rulemaking, uh, uh, privacy, uh, legislation in, in the states. But unfortunately, we are out of time. So I hope all of you will join me in thanking all of our panelists for the insights that they so gracefully shared today.